It's uh, di diametrically opposed to where, I'm at, to where I am. There's another interesting aspect to it. We are going through the pains of being in a hit series, a series that I would venture to say is the most popular series in the world. I mean that. And if What's you it on in this country? 140 stations in the United States? Uh, 115 countries. And 115 in other countries? 115 it's stations around 115. Yeah. 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 Uh, the mail comes from all over. Germany, England, it's the same there. It's just as hot and getting hotter all the time. It seems to be seething and multiplying. But we're going through the pains of doing a successful hit show without doing the show. That's and right. also not getting and paid for it. <laughs> no rerun money. Oh, no. We, don't, we, we no. haven't received rerun money, I think, in what, five years? No. No because rerun we money. We were paid and for uh, the, uh, in the first year's shows, we were paid up to six reruns. And the uh, second and third year shows, we were paid up to ten reruns. And uh, we have not received any money for five years, so they must be up to the 35th or the 40th rerun one or the other. But there's one thing that I would like to say that I think that is, uh, I mean, I think all the actors, uh, when they look within themselves uh, and they look uh, towards the future, is that one of the fabulous things about it, uh, from my point of view anyway, is that here you are, uh, still relatively young, and you are a member of a classic. And that is beautiful. Your great-grandchildren will still be seeing Star Trek. The shows will still be that good you know, and they will last, and uh, they but, will be saying... But as he says, it's also a little scary knowing that you're the star of a hit show... Of a ghost. And it's a ghost. That's true. That's right. Incidentally, I noticed in the film, it would not have helped to have a large stomach with the costumes that you were That's assigned right. to wear, huh? No, that doesn't help at all. No, <laughs> no it doesn't help. I hope they have different costumes for the feature. <laughs> Let me pause for these announcements and we will, uh, we will continue here with the Star Trekkers in two minutes and five seconds. <laughs> Thank you, Bill Wendell. What was it like when you knew that it wasn't going to last very much longer and that the series had been canceled by NBC? That's just got to have a uh, terrible effect on, on your morale and your approach to it and everything. You else. mean the third year, the end of that third year right. when we knew? Right. Oh, it was a very distressing. Well, in the second year, wasn't there talk of it going off yeah, after the yeah, second year, yeah. too? It was talk from the beginning. <laughs> in fact, if it was it such was a hit... It was always in trouble. If it is such a hit, why weren't the ratings better on the damn thing? Well, I, I don't know. There are many uh, schools of thought on that. I don't think Star Trek really ever had the proper time slot, for one thing. Yeah. I think it should have been on at 7.30 at night and yeah. stayed there. Yeah, but... Uh, well, you better slip off. Uh, but okay. it was a very distressing thought, you know, because we knew that we were, when they put us in that 10 o'clock Friday night slot, we knew that was the graveyard slot, and we knew it was on its way out. And we, we felt all along that we were doing something rather special, that this was a, a show that should not go off the air. Again, reflected by our mail, because we were very low in the, in, in the ratings, but we were breaking every fan mail uh, record in the history of NBC. So the two don't add up. You know, the 1,200 homes that govern you is what puts Star Trek off the air. That's the way it has to be. But my we were breaking all kinds of fan mail records. Yes. So I was you know, told that we the were very big in the, uh, the in the 30 cities waiting, but not in the uh, in, in the, the nationals. Yeah. In the nationals, we. Uh, I'd like to suggest something terribly sacrilegious. I believe that, uh, and I have, I'm not privy to any special information, but I believe that the ratings probably did reflect accurately. Uh, our popularity in terms of the network audience. Uh, I think that our that our followers were passionate, vociferous, and militant, and they were emulatory. They were ready to go out and pick it. They were ready to you know, do anything they could. I think it, it represented a a minority of the viewing public uh, below which you can bring us. You can keep a show on the air. However, and that's the big thing, and that's why I feel safe in saying that. I, I happen to believe it, but I feel safe in saying it. I think in syndication. We now have the numbers that we would have needed to stay on the air at that time because we've gone beyond the, the metropolis, the metropolitan kind of uh, uh, climate. Uh, to, uh, people all over the country are watching the show. The Great Breadbasket, the Bible Belt. You know, science fiction, uh, something that I wasn't particularly familiar with before or was aware of, but science fiction is considered anti-religious or has been. But with the, 
But with the continual repeating of the shows over and over again, we have picked up an audience all through the country that is diversified, that is not simply children, that is not simply college students, that is, it is, a, it is, it is really the entire scope of this country. What you're really saying, Walter, is that when a local station has that program in its vault, it can schedule it at the time it feels it will reach the, the most responsive audience to it yeah. instead of simply taking it down the line from the television network when the, when the gods of power uh, in New York decide it's going to be on. Right. But and also, uh, you know, when Walter talks about the Bible Belt, just about every Star Trek show was a great morality play also. You know, there was there were beautiful uh, things said on there, and there was, uh, there was lovely truths uh, that were stated, and uh, everyone worked together in a loving way. You know, and all the characters worked. Uh, I'm just sitting here wondering now. Suppose that that, uh, that one of the networks put it back into production for for prime Not time. Not one. It would have to be NBC. They own the rights. There. All right. Suppose NBC, which to level is not having one of the great rating years in its history. Uh, suppose they decided, hey, you know, conventions all over the country, everything going on. Let's put the thing back on and see what happens. Would it work or would it destroy the myth and the, and the legend? I don't know. That's a you know that old thing of can you go home again you know uh, and it's the same we have the gamble with the motion picture where we did 75 79 episodes there's got to be one episode and that everybody's going to like but when you come out with one shot on the movie mm -hmm. you know not everyone is maybe going to like the movie but uh, it, it's, it would be a, a big question uh, uh, as to whether or not... Uh, Wouldn't you think the movie, though, is almost a, a pretty well calculated risk? I mean, the audience well, is built yes, in. Well, I would it. think that... Yeah. Uh, I, think, I think everybody believes that, it, it, that it's, as you say, that the, it's, it's a pretty well... It's a foregone conclusion. The only problem is, is that if they decide, because it's a, it's a feature film as opposed to a television show, that they have to change the thrust of it in some way, make it monsters and huge battle scenes something that will you know that'll, that you can't get on television you may um, you may uh, distort and transporting it to the big screen and then yes, trying to yeah. make it bigger to fit right yeah, you may yeah. may distort the entire uh, feeling of the show you may, you may uh, I think it needs a, a, a storyline something on the order of of the crew uh, encountering Christ in space <laughs> and finding out that Christ is actually Lucifer <laughs> I just don't know if we're quite ready for that one yet. <laughs> Apparently, we're not. Apparently, <laughs> Apparently not. not. I don't believe we are. <laughs> Let me uh, just pause here for a couple of minutes for our stations, and then we will <clears throat> have Mr. Harlan Ellison out, who wrote one of the most popular episodes in the history of Star Trek, and we'll be right back after these announcements. Joining us now, Mr. Harlan Ellison, who is no stranger to this audience. Mr. Ellison was on our all-night program. We did a show on science fiction writing with uh, Harlan and Gene Roddenberry and, uh, and others, including Ray Bradbury out in Los Angeles a little over a year ago. And Harlan wrote what many people consider to be one of the finest uh, episodes of Star Trek, a program called City on the Edge of Forever. It won a Hugo, which is the Science Fiction Award that year, and also the best outstanding dramatic presentation of that season on television. Joining us also, Al Schuster, who has been producing Star Trek conventions around the country ever since the Star Trek phenomenon resurfaced. Harlan, how are you, my friend? All right? Have we told any lies out here about the show or the effort that went into it? Well, I'm getting... You're always the keeper of truth? Yeah, well, I, I, I you know, I, I, I know all these fellows and, and, they're, and they're truthful people, but I, I'm afraid I was developing diabetes from all the sweetness and light. That's, <laughs> that's all. Well, we can be prepared for a little sour then, eh? No. It, well, it wasn't all sweetness and light, but backstage things happen. There are arguments, are there not? Huh? There, there sweetness and light but backstage things happen there are arguments are there not huh there there were those yes i didn't work for the show after i did my one segment i why not i felt that uh they had mucked it up badly and uh it took i think six or seven years before gene roddenberry even and i even spoke to each other again after the show uh, the thing that always troubled me about the, about the series was that there was always the feeling that the, they were presenting great moral messages and uh to me they were always very lightweight and any time uh, you try to really deal with what Faulkner called the human heart in conflict with itself, either the network or the production, you know, people uh, said, no, no, the, our characters wouldn't act that way. In other words, they, they, they always had to be heroes. It's amazing how they know how characters would yeah. act. They know how hair should look, how mm -hmm. ties should be tied, how teeth should be fixed. They know all those things in the offices. It's amazing. 
I'm, 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 the, the, the thing that, the thing that really amazes me is what you call the Star Trek phenomenon. I, I did a convention here in town just a week or so ago, and 30,000 people were there, riots, somebody hit Shatner with a pie. <laughs> pie killed, yeah. Pie, somebody hired Pike. Did you know about that? Yes, I was. I walked out on stage shortly. What after goes? What? What? Al? What goes on at these things? What do you do? Do you show the films or? Uh... Certainly, that's just part of it. Uh, the actors, these fellows all here, Harlan, come out and speak, uh, come out and do their shtick, whatever it is. Uh, there's a. There are several other aspects to the convention. There's a large dealers' room. All sorts of things are sold. This medallion, uh, tribbles. Like yeah, those. what are these? Tell what these are. I don't remember. Hairballs. They're <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Fuzz balls. From the, they're, from they're, the... uh, they're, they're, they're very similar, very akin to the uh, pet rocks that are floating around now. Mm -hmm. There's a big uh, fad. But Tribbles were the uh, creation of uh, one episode of Star Trek. Didn't we? And David Gerald, who created it. David Gerald, obviously. Uh, the man so who wrote Tribbles it. actually gave birth to the pet rocks. There are several uh, Tribbles in existence that have been known give birth to a, uh, to help me out, will you please? <laughs> Come on, you got yourself a pet rock, rock, yeah. rock is a triple with hiding of the arteries. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. But we didn't understand that one. <laughs> now, when you fellas come out at the convention, do you make a talk or do you have set routines? Like, well, what do you do? Come out, we make a, um, a talk. We, and then we go into a question and answer thing. It, uh, that seems to be uh, what they want to do. They want to talk to you. They want to communicate and ask you questions about yourself, and about the show, experiences on show, that sort of thing. What do you think would happen if it came back on prime time? I think it would do very nicely indeed. Uh, you look at the, what, what is it, Space 1999 that's in syndication? They're yeah. going for a second year now. And it's a lox, and it's uh, doing well enough. Uh, clearly, the public is ready for science fiction. They want something good. Well, I'm, s I'm sorry. What am I going to do? Am I going to lie to you? <laughs> if you bring me on, you know I'll tell you the truth. I know you'll yeah. tell me the truth, but is it highly possible, in the truth as you perceive it, sir, that television is simply not equipped to deal with what you want to put on a 19-inch on, on a diagonal tube. No, the truth of the matter is that television is the best medium that has ever been devised, including the print medium, for dealing with fantasy. The problem lies in the fact that uh, the moguls, none of whom are creators, they're all, you know, failed agents or, or failed uh, CPAs or failed, you know, whatever they are. Ex-booth announcers. Massage yeah. parlor guys. Yeah. Who the hell knows what they yeah. do for a living yeah. when they're not, yeah. you know, messing our lives up? They don't understand. What you used science. to do? W-I-L-X-T-V Lansing. Right. Hey, Drake, couldn't they, do it. They, now they I'm in here in. planning your life for you. Yeah. They, they see machinery. They see machinery. And they think that's what science fiction is. And it isn't. It's people. And it's the effect of the future on people. They cannot get it through their heads. This year... Every one, all three of the major networks are looking, in quotes, for a science fiction project. And when one is offered to them, they say, well, no, we don't understand that. I, I don't explain it to you. And, and uh, I had a meeting. If you have to do that, you're lost. Oh, yeah, the instant right? you explain it. Yeah, right. It's right like the telling back. them the plot of Moby Dick. Well, it's a nut chasing a big fish, right? <laughs> <laughs> listen, listen. I'm, I'm about to talk myself out of a job. I mean, the, the movie, the Star Trek movie, right? Gene, uh, there have been 967 writers called in on this project. Last word, there was no script. They got a director, they got a star date, no script. I think they're going to stand there and whistle. Who knows? Roddenberry called me in. He says, you know, he was really desperate to call me in. And he said, uh, let's, <laughs> let's, let's try. Like you said, you're about to blow a job, huh? Right? <laughs> oh, yo, yeah. I'm, look, look, no, Gene knows what I'm going to say. Gene's, Gene's cool. Uh, we came in and we, we, we thought up a, an idea. Paramount keeps saying to them, no matter what plot they offer them, it's not big enough. It's not big enough, right? That's what he was saying. Right. He said, then what if we destroyed the universe? <laughs> we thought that was big enough. No, it wasn't big enough. <laughs> so, it's like on the news. World ends, details at 10. Right, how about if they go into space and find Jim Audrey and find out he's God, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, anyhow, <laughs> I have a meeting with a guy from Paramount, the guy, the guy who's in, he's the liaison. He's the interface between... The great powers on the floor. You know why I held you till after 1.30, you know? A few people go to bed, like Jim Aubrey might be gone now. You know, I, I, I don't want you to lose it all when you're out here. <laughs> Listen, I must have a suicide complex. I wouldn't be in Hollywood to begin with. Uh. Hey, they, we come in for a story. We get a story. It's a, it's a super duper story. G, uh, Gene and I work it out, and it's all solid. So in comes this Tum Tum from, from, from the head office, and he's going he's gonna to listen to it. We explain the whole thing to him. It's complex, but it's fascinating. It goes back to the dawn of time and a parallel species that grew up with, with humankind and so on and so on. And the whole thing. When you get all done, he sits there and he goes, hmm. He says, well, you know, I was reading Von Doniken, and, uh, you know, the Mayan calendar is the same as our calendar. Why don't you put in some Mayans? We said, uh, Mayans? He says, yeah, why don't you put in the Mayans? That's terrific. And, and Gene and I kind of look at each other like, mm -hmm. We tried to explain to him there were no Mayans at the dawn of time. He, he didn't understand that. So um, he said, well, I'll, I'll tell it to... 
<laughs> Stummy, whatever his name was, up in the tower. And that was that. So and I... we'll get back to you. Yeah, and they never do. Yeah. Never... Yeah. Oh, no, no. Yeah. Listen, we're going to have to fire you. Oh, yeah? When do I, when am I through? Well, we'll get back to you. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the Red Queen's race. You've got to run as fast as you can to stay in the same place. What was oh. your first convention like? Was it a smash? Certainly. The very first one? Yes, surprisingly so. We anticipated probably four or five hundred people would show up. Almost 3,000 showed up at the Statler Hilton Hotel in 71. I'm sorry, 72, January 9th. And how many of these do you run a year? Uh, well, in the past, I was only running one, but uh, in the last few months, I've put on three conventions. Uh, one in August in Philadelphia, one in over January 1st weekend in Washington, D.C. Where, incidentally, um, I had a, a transporter mechanism brought in. It's the first time it's ever been uh, shown at a Star Trek convention. It worked very similar to the uh, transporter effect shown on television. It came out of... Uh, Chicago. Chicago, creative presentations. It's a... Uh, what does it do? It, it makes people appear. It's magic. Yeah, and it, we materialize. <laughs> right. Lights. Lights. You mean lights and They materialize on, on stage. Oh, I see. I Literally see. materialize on I stage. I mean, people don't disintegrate and go across the room and... Well, it mm, looks like it. It looks suspiciously you know, like it. it they had the sparkles and everything else there. Uh, it would look like it. Absolutely. Can it I put a beautiful. couple of network heads in that thing? <laughs> <laughs> uh, we didn't lose anybody. There's going to be another convention. Now, that's, what, three in a row? Three uh, in a row in New York. Hotel. Do you, uh, fellas who were in the series, do you like going to these conventions, truthfully? I, or, or sometimes you say to yourself, I just don't want to go to another convention. I feel that well, way. It's getting that way. I know way. you do. <laughs> yeah. I know you do. I have the yeah. feeling that you feel that way. I haven't gone to too many of them, and I'm getting a little tired of it. Mm -hmm. I got I'm a quote lazy anyhow. So it's... Hold the quote for a couple of minutes. I got these little announcements. Last break we have, so we'll get them out of the way, and we'll be right back and hear a quote from Marlon Ellis. I want people to find Yeah, <laughs> let's not go into that. No, no, no. no. Let's never mention that. No, of course not. No. Of course not. No. You know, why I'll up a recip, you know what no, I mean? No, no, I'm cool. Okay, now here's the quote. All right, this was a, uh, this is a quote from a, from a Incidentally, book. Incidentally, is, is, is the movie script, you have no script, you said. That's not progressed the, one iota. As far beyond. as I know, as of yesterday afternoon, there was no script. Gene was, I understand, working with other writers. Who they may be, God only knows. Uh, whether there'll be a script or not, I don't know. Right. But you're off the movie. As far as I... They haven't gotten back to me. I, but, <laughs> but, Tom, got a note from Gene Roddenberry, which I think is interesting. He said, we have a starting date, yeah. July 15th, right. but we don't have a script. But he said, what the hell? He said, there are a lot of people that have scripts that don't have a starting date. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Beautiful. Did he mention a year? <laughs> no, he didn't mention, didn't a, mention year, a year. So. Well, we'll get back to you. Okay. <laughs> Quote. Okay, this is, uh, this is from a, a book review of a, of, a, of a paperback that came out that was marketed as, if you like Star Trek, you'll love this book, okay? And uh, the, the, the critic, John Kurlovich, said, the ever-spreading influence of that, he says, still there remains the fascinating question of why the author of this book didn't latch on to a better model for a novel than Star Trek. There remains the fascinating question of why the author of this book didn't latch on to a better model for a novel than Star Trek. The ever-spreading influence of that show is now an undeniable fact. A good deal has been said and written about this phenomenon, but many seem to agree that the program's advocates, whatever else they are, are appallingly indiscriminate. What can one make of a mentality that not only condones mediocrity, but believes it to be something good, something decidedly worth emulating? Now that is the most, that is the most dead-on quote I've ever heard about the Star Trek phenomenon. As good as the show may have been, at best, all it is really is a television show. There are no great conventions of 30,000 people going to discuss Proust's remembrance of things past. Uh, there are not people dashing in to pay homage to Ralph Nader, the Ralph Nader convention. This was a, plain and simple, is a kind of hero worship that is on the same plane with the Beatles, uh, on the same plane with, you know, Elvis Presley or, or Jacqueline Suzanne books. It's, uh, it's better for TV, but what we're talking about again is that great swamp of television drama which at best never touches, you know, even the middle range of what is done in other medium. Ta-da! Okay, but I think you need, I think you need a frame of reference. Now, what do you, you know, you cannot, you cannot translate or cannot transcribe uh, the, the quality of a novel uh, and, and compare that to uh, the, the quality of a television show. Why not? Because they're, they're apples and oranges, that's why. 
You can't, you can't, we know that from our personal experience on doing that, that science fiction seminar. I took some of the f uh, finest uh, novelists, uh, fantasy novelists, and had professional actors read from them, and it was dull because it doesn't translate. It does, it's not theater. It's not necessarily theater. Well, that, but that wasn't drama. That was a straight reading. What we're talking about is the difference between the best of the Star Trek episodes and any one segment of, say, Rich Man, Poor Man, which is running on another, another okay. network. Oh. And it, clearly you can take, you know, meaningful, gut-level material and translate it to a television medium so that you don't insult the viewers. Yes, but now here's something that's quite interesting. You mentioned Rich Man, Poor Man, which is running on ABC. Now... Irwin Shaw's book was a wonderful book to read, mm -hmm. I thought. I enjoyed the book, all right? I read an account of that show in one of the news magazines this week where they say that it's poorly written, poorly presented, and, and, and that it, it really isn't worth all the trouble of watching. I heard the same thing. Yeah, Newsweek or Time. Yeah. Had a little cat, one of their little quick shots. I, the, I, I, all I can say is I watched it, and I was, I was fascinated. I didn't read the book. I watched it, <coughs> I thought, great. Yeah, I thought it was great. You know? But there's always somebody who will take what's on television, and we're all guilty of it. Like this, this guy who wrote this here, and what you're saying tonight is going to say, well, it's no good. Yet here is something that you think is of value, but I can give you four opinions where they say, well, it's of no value. No, no, he didn't say it's bad. What he said is it's mediocre. And that, I think, is the crime. Bad, I can understand. I mean, I can even understand someone making a motion picture that, where they try to do something. I mean, the, God knows how many of those, where they strive to do something, and they fail dismally, but they tried. The best that anything tries to do on Star Trek or anything else on television is to hit, hit that median, which is where they failed because they tried to be a little bit better and they didn't get the Bible Belt. Instead of conscientiously educating a television audience throughout the nation to want better things, they give them one more cop show. Jigsaw John went on the other night. There's another cop show. The Cop and a Kid, that'll last 15 minutes, you know. Well, what, what you're doing cop when you talk about the, the cop, cop the shows kid, is, cop, cop is, is you're, you're praising Star Trek, really, because Star Trek was much more than any cop show you ever want to see. No, it was a cop show. Oh, Star Trek on. was a cop show, too. Oh, sure, it was spacemen acting like cops. Oh, it wasn't. Didn't, oh, you? Wasn't. didn't, you, go through the, didn't you go through the galaxy <laughs> and straighten things out? There were a few things. <laughs> come on, you fought evil. Fess up. Come on, you evil. There's some total, you know, you can't knock it that way. Uh, I think that every episode of Star Trek did something that they preached in every episode they didn't do, and that was stress violence. I think that there was violence in every, every episode of Star Trek as much as they preached that there wasn't, or that, uh, that man had overcome his violent aspect. There was violence in every episode. Mm. Yeah, but generally it wasn't man. It was some android or some It was one of those galactic terrible monsters. little green people, with, you know. Yeah. Right. But I think, I think that, isn't that fascinating? Isn't that fascinating? Any time they kill someone off, it was always a member of a third, third world race, right? <laughs> Go ahead, shoot him down. He's green. What does it matter? <laughs> <laughs> we didn't shoot him. We stunned well, him. Vulcan <laughs> <Stunned him. laughs> <Stunned him. laughs> nerve pinched him. Where is that thing that you uh, had out here, that gun? There show? you are. No, no, no. You, right. you demonstrate what it does, because I don't understand the technology. <laughs> That's that. right. That's you right. Know? Go ahead. Want to. Go, <laughs> go crazy with the gun. Yeah. <laughs> now, let me see here. We have That's stun. Can you see that? All right. Stun Stunning. force? Now, twist the dial. <laughs> right. That sounds like a treble. I don't know what... <laughs> now, these are for sale at the conventions, huh? Well, this is a prototype, I believe, that was made by the people at the Federation uh, Trading Post, which is a store devoted entirely to Star Trek gar uh, stuff. There's one east and one west. <laughs> <laughs> you really hated it, didn't no, you? No, man. Listen, <laughs> you wrote your one episode. No, you know what huh? I hate? You know what I hate? Honest to God, I hate... Reverence for things that don't deserve them. I know you hate that. Yeah, but I also hate the fact that it's the exploitation of the gullible. I mean, you see the things that these kids buy when they go to these conventions. They spend hundreds of thousands of dollars because it's, it's Star Trek affiliated, you know. I mean, if they want to watch the show, Dynamite, let them watch. Better that than they should be out in the street, you know, stealing hubcaps. But they're being really exploited. $12 a day to go and listen to, you know, James Dewan explain the ethical structure of the universe. I mean, this is a bit of exploitation. I thought fun. it was worth it. Yet you went to one. I went for money, man. <laughs> he goes for all of I went for money. They pay me a staggering sum of money, but I don't do a Star Trek gig. I get up and I read my stories. Anybody wants to come and listen to me read my stories, dynamite. But I do the same thing I would do anyplace else. Yeah, and they all get up and leave, right? Well, that's true. <laughs> that's true. Brings the audience to their feet as they head for the exits. Right. <laughs> I have a limited audience, but they're an intelligent one. Yeah. I, I'd like to, Tom, can I just say one thing? Yeah, what I, do we got left? 45 show? Okay. 30 seconds. Okay. Uh, I think you've got to consider Star Trek not as the, the ultimate in terms of 
in terms of quality television or, or, or science fiction on television, but as a departure point, I think it's without question the best episodic science fiction that has ever been on television. That doesn't mean that it's the best television that uh, there ever was, but certainly if you consider it as a as a departure, as a place, uh, as a jumping off place, then you, I think you have to you have a very positive attitude about what's going to happen with 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 television and the quality of television. Star Trek broke. New roads. I Eight really years ago, that. and nothing's happened since. Well, no, we're okay. coming back. Jets, we're coming I'm, back, baby. I'm out of time. We had another piece of film to show, and I never got it on because we were having such a wonderful time listening to Harwin Ellison tell us that it was all. <laughs> Sometime you're coming on here, and we're going to tell the stories you've been through in the television industry, and you we're going to name the names. You're on. Okay, you're so on. are you. We'll tape it right after we get it finished tonight. We'll be right back after these <laughs> announcements, and I hope all of you will stay here. <laughs>